Okay. Okay, Grace, why don't you go ahead and get started? Hi, everyone. Welcome to this evening's book launch for the newly released Lizzie and Dante. My name is Grace, and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. Let us know where you're zooming in from in the chat. Thank you for supporting tonight's author event and a local indie bookstore. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. In fact, we're celebrating our 121st anniversary this year. Tonight, we're excited to present what I'm going to declare to be the most fun event of the summer. Mary Bly in conversation with her dear friend, Julia Quinn, to celebrate the launch of Mary's new book, Lizzie and Dante. A few announcements before we start. This event is being recorded and will be played back on our YouTube channel in a few days. We'll be dropping the link for Mary's book in the chat periodically, and you can purchase a copy with signed book plates from us at any time. We thank you for your ongoing support. After Mary and Julia's discussion, there will be a chance for audience Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A field at the bottom of your Zoom screens at any time during their talk, and we'll get to them at the end. A little bit of Lizzie and Dante. Lizzie and Dante is a luscious story of love, courage, and Italian wine. And I believe <laughs> Mary's got some wine with her today, which demands to know how yes. far you can travel to find a future worth fighting for. Mary Bly is a New York Times bestselling author under the name Eloisa James and chair of the English department at Fordham University. She lives with her family in New York City, but can sometimes be found in Paris or Italy. She's the mother of two and in a particularly delicious irony for romance writer, is married to a genuine Italian knight. She'll be in conversation today with number one New York Times bestselling author, Julia Quinn, who loves to dispel the myth that smart women don't read or write romance. And if you watch reruns of the game show, The Weakest Link, you might just catch her winning the $79,000 jackpot. She displayed a decided lack of knowledge about baseball, country music, and plush toys, but she is proud to say that she aced all things British and literary, answered all of her history and geography questions correctly, and knew that there was a da Vinci long before there was a code. In 2020, Netflix premiered Bridgerton, which I'm sure we have all seen and binge watched, based on her popular series of novels about the Bridgerton family. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Mary and Julia. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Oh, okay. I am, um, this is kind of a new experience for me. I've never, like, I'm supposed to be interviewing you. Not really sure to say, because I feel like I already know you pretty well. But I want to say, so I've been was reading everybody. This is Lizzie and Dante, which you probably all purchased since you're coming here. And it, I have the fans, the, well, the not so fancy advanced readers copy. So everybody else's copy might look a little different. But it was really fascinating to me to read this for a number of reasons. Um, and I have to confess, I wasn't completely able to keep the writer out of my head. Um, and a lot of it was just because I know you so well, but also I know your writing voices, Eloisa James so well. And I even know some of your writing like techniques and methods and like what makes you tick and how you think of stories. And so, it was hard for me like at times to be like, this is so different. Mm -hmm. and, and not just in, not just in tone or story or that, but just I could tell that the experience of writing it must have been very, very different, both in terms of, and you can tell me if I'm way off base. I mean, obviously it's gonna be very different in terms of the emotions you feel while you're writing it, because it's a very different type of story, but I would think even the methodology of how you approach it, how you craft it, how you put it together, how you make the characters must have been very, very different. And I was wondering if you could speak to that at all. Um, I realize that's an enormous question, but you know, if I ask one enormous question, we might be able to go a really long time. Um, 
Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, it took me four and a half years to write. So I had to learn a whole different way of writing because, you know, I grew up on a farm, right? A, a farm outside a town of 2000 in Minneapolis. I never met a Duke. I've never been in a Regency ballroom. You know, my experience of writing in the Regency is about as authentic as yours, really. We, we have strong imaginations and a good historical background, and that's about it. I mean, the history is the wallpaper. You said that once, and I've never forgotten it. And um, that's really true. Whereas here, when I started to write this book, I realized... I'm writing a book that's kind of about a lot of things that are in my life. So my heroine is a professor, she's a Shakespeare professor, and she's someone who's been diagnosed with cancer, which happened to me, right? And she's someone who has a 12 year old girl, which just happened to both of us. And I, Anna, my daughter Anna is older than that now, but her 12 year old self was very much with me. She goes to Alba, she marries an Italian. That happened to me too. Unfortunately, my husband is not a chef. In fact, he can't cook at all, really but he's not listening. So um, we, we still love him. Yeah, we still love him. And I, I went to Alba every summer for years because in Italy, that's what you do. You take your children to an island in the month of July and Alba is not a fancy island like Capri where tourists go. It's just an island where Italian families go mm -hmm. and where there's a lot of weather beaten little restaurants. And um, I got the idea for this book one summer when we walked into a very weather beaten restaurant and it actually had the horoscopes painted on the on the floor it was very 1960s and mm -hmm. i it was he was a brilliant chef and so that that experience is very very different than constructing a regency fantasy getaway which is what my historicals are they're escapist this mm -hmm. is escapist too because we'd all like to escape to Elba right now, <laughs> but, True. Um, but, but, but you're right, it's different. And I was also you know, just struck by the different characters too. You had, I mean, you had your main characters and their love stories, but I felt that the supporting characters, well, I mean, you, you always have a big cast in the, in the, um, in your historicals, but I just felt like the, the supporting characters maybe had more of a story going on of their own than you might see in the secondary characters in one of your historical romances. It, it was very different. I mean, they create a family, right? By the end, it's really about what the, the book is. It's a love story, but it's not just a love story between Lizzie and Dante. It's, it's a love story in which Ed is involved, but in which all, they, they form a new family at the end. Mm -hmm. And I wanted the book to be about love in all kinds of different ways. Whereas when you're writing a romance, you really are kind of circumscribed. I mean, the, the journey so-called is between the two main characters. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, okay, so look at the Bridgertons. There's a lot of people around and then they're gonna come forward and have their own story. But when they have their moment in the limelight, it'll be them in the limelight. And that's who you're reading about. You know, Same thing in my stories when I write like a series about a family or something, but here, this is this I I could make them much more fully rounded people because it wasn't just about two people falling in love. Makes sense. It does. I, so I keep looking back at this. I, I want to hear more about Elba though, and I hear you. You have some pictures or maybe a video. Yes, I have a video. So because all, so. all I know of Elba is what you've told me over the years, because I know that you go and the, you know, Napoleon and Abel was I, ere I saw Elba, because I like calendars. So I actually have three trailers. Oh, so okay. I can show you the one that's actually the introduction to Elba. And what happened is I, you know, I'm a professor, right? So I have all these students who are all desperate to like, you know, practice their skills. And so this actually has a voiceover from a young woman who would like to be a voiceover actor. And um, so I'm going to show you the first one. And then if you want to see more, I can show you. So this one is well, we the voiceover. we can them throughout. Yeah. This okay. is the voiceover of when Lizzie and Dante meet. It's not the voiceover about the island of Elba, which also okay. exists. Okay. Okay. So hold on one second. Okay. I'm gonna go big here. And all right, it's Lizzie. Tell me she if you can hear it. Said after a while. I can hear it. You're gonna love this, English professor. He said, sounding drowsy. Dante. She did, brother. 
If I ever had a son, I meant to name him Dante, Prospero, or Lucho. He raised his head and peered at her. Thirty? Thirty-two, but not for long. Even if your birthday is tomorrow, you have time to have Dante, Prospero, and Lucho. His casual comment felt like a punch in the gut, the kind that sent Lizzie's mind racing down a familiar path. How could a 30-year-old have been diagnosed with cancer? She pulled her mind away. I won't have a son named Dante, she said. Ah, oh. he laid down again. I have a 12-year-old daughter. You can see it's kind of artistic. <laughs> oh, I'm next Disney Housewives. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right, it's on the artistic side. I just got my cash back match. Is this real? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the cash back <laughs> you're you're still having your ad. I was going to hold on. Suddenly, starting to contain yourself, isn't it? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to get rid of it. This almost happened to my class too. Coming this fall to Bravo. You love the Real Housewives of Atlanta. I feel like we're on an episode of Authors. They're just like us. The Real Housewives of. Can't get rid of it. Just a second. One sec. I'm just find it. Water. Okay, I think we're. I think we're good. Oh no! But now you're muted. Are you muted? Uh oh. Well, folks, anybody got a question for me while we're hoping for to get Mary's sound back? Okay, we're in trouble. Oh, no, never mind. No more questions for me. We got her. Okay. Okay. Can you give me a testing? One, two, three. All right. I'm back. Okay. Just a second. I'm back. Okay. Sorry. That's it's okay. Over. You know, my Mac has got these two screens. And it flipped over to the other screen, and so I couldn't find it. Okay. Well, it was very funny because I could still kind of hear you, but you looked very lost. I was like, I don't think she's looking at us. <laughs> um, okay. So All another right. question I had was why you chose to sort of construct the novel around Romeo and Juliet as opposed to a different Shakespearean play. Is it in part because it's the most well-known and people know the story? Or was there more to it that you wanted to bring it forward in that way? Having never taken your, your class, I don't know what you focus on. <laughs> the, um, well, there's a whole bunch of answers to that. But partly, it's that this book, I wanted to, to sort of write a book about what I've learned about being an almost Italian citizen for this many years, right? And for 26 years. And... Italians are very different than Americans. I grew up with workaholic parents who worked all the time. And it was always like on the weekend, like, what are you writing? What are you doing? You know, they were both writers and, and, and I have two full-time jobs. So I've, I've excelled at being their child. Mm -hmm. But when I married Alessandro and we started going to Italy in the summer because we're both professors, I realized there really is this completely different way of approaching life, which is I get up and I go to the shop every day. I buy the food that I'm going to eat that day, right? The freshest food. And then I cook it slowly. And then I eat lunch with wine every day because that's what you do. And then you have a sonolino, you have a little nap and you wake up, maybe you do a little cleaning, you cook for the night and you're, you're, it sounds to Americans, maybe unproductive, but to Italians, it sounds happy. And it, it, there's always a jolt where I, I bring myself into that kind of happiness that Americans talk a lot about, oh, I need to be in the moment. I have to have 15 apps that all teach me how to be in the moment. But Italians are much better at being in the moment than we are, especially mm -hmm. when they're on vacation. Then when they're on vacation, they are on vacation. You mm -hmm. know, they are there. They drift from restaurant to the beach, to a bar. They, you know, dance on the beach. I mean, they are kind of seriously romantic. So mm -hmm. the thing about Romeo and Juliet, and you don't have to have read the play really even to, um, it's not like my characters are Romeo and Juliet, but if you asked Romeo and Juliet the characters, would they still fall in love if they knew they only had three days? The answer would be absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. So I'll just say that in the case of my, my character, Lizzie, she's had a cancer diagnosis. Like me, she's gonna be fine, but she's trying to decide whether to go on and have treatment Mm -hmm. you know and in fact she decides to have that treatment and so she'll be able to come back to Elba you know in summers after the summer I show but that decision 
that that um, the time in which you fall in love is important no matter how short it is. It's something that I learned from teaching Romeo and Juliet for 20 years. And I wanted to be an integral part of this book. So that's why the, you know, her friend Rohan is the producer of the new Romeo and Juliet that's going to be produced by Disney. Because, you know, Romeo and Juliet is produced for every new generation over and over again. Right. You know? I did love that he's Captain Britain. I thought that yes. was awesome. He's Captain um, Britain. But you just said something that was interesting to me. You said, like me, she's going to be okay. But that wasn't my sense when reading it. My sense when reading it was that she was not going to be okay. Well, she's not going to, I mean, she's not as okay as I am. Okay. But she, she, she does choose to go back and have treatment. Right. And, and for people who are struggling right now with ovarian cancer, the new treatments that they have are incredibly good. The targeted I mean, you know, your husband would probably know a lot more about it than I do, but the, the new targeted sort of therapies, gene therapies are, are mm -hmm. quite effective. So and you she, did a lot of research specifically on ovarian cancer? Yeah. I mean, my mother died of ovarian cancer, right? But she died just before all these new wonderful things came out. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of targeted therapy is giving people a lot more time than they would have than she had. Mm -hmm. And also one of the things that that is actually just really briefly discussed in the book is this kind of heat operation that did you now where they, they, um, I know it's kind I of, I saw that it was very uh, intriguing. You dropped it because I love medical stuff. You know that you drop yeah. these little things in just these tiny bits. And I was like, wait, did I miss something? You know, I'm going to say anyway. no, cause it's not really about, it's not about having a brain cancer. It's not about anything like that. It's about her deciding. You I know it's not, but I kept thinking, I was like, wait, did she say that? No, because you think that, I mean, when um, I had a very, um, you know, not a difficult case of breast cancer, but there are moments when you're like, geez, I, I'm not enjoying treatment. I think I'm just going to quit. And mm -hmm. when she comes to Alba, the person she loves most in the world is gray. Mm -hmm. And she's even giving away her books. I mean, she's, she's, she's cutting her ties and yeah. then Dante pulls her right down to earth. And the the child who she can't have because she's had ovarian cancer become you know it's Etta and it's there and Etta wants a mother and mm -hmm. she wants Etta so so it's kind of this this learning journey that has to do with what do I want in life right do I really want to be a dandelion and float away or do I want to be in love do I want to love mm -hmm. how important is that I have these questions and comments but I don't want to give any spoilers and I'm afraid this is what this is what, this is what happens when you get a non-professional to like lead one of these things so I'm like I don't know how to ask questions without spoiling things um so well why don't you ask me about Elba again because I think a lot of people ask me about that okay oh. you know yeah well I, I had a question about a, well, not a question just a comment about a very specific moment that was super poignant um oh, ask me that come on yeah, well, it was just a comment. I, well, I don't want to give anything away, but I'll just say it's the lullaby. The lullaby. The I love the lullaby. Yay. The lullaby. That was really beautiful. And, okay. and, and uh, well, this won't give anything away. When Edda crawled into her lap, I was like, <laughs> not me. You, uh, you know, and I'm, it was, oh. it's like, <laughs> it's just you. <laughs> um, That's yes. I, um, yes, I do want to hear more about Elba. So I'll tell you, oh, when she says, Julia, it's not just you. Oh, it's very hard to discuss without spoilers. Thank you. Okay, so the two people who work with your last this is very hard. To very hard. We're so going to talk about, about how all day. So I will confess, many years ago, I did I even know? No, I must have known you at this point. Um, I got like a bee in my bonnet, and I I started, you know, would find some internet rabbit hole that you can't stop going going to, and I found this website called summerinitaly.com, okay. and I just looking at these houses to rent. And then I was looking at, and I ended up just up and renting a house for four weeks. And then kind of telling my husband, you're like, oh, I, it's a little weird. I just rented a house for four weeks, even though I know you can't be there the whole time. <laughs> so she can keep going. He's like, yeah, that's a little weird. So, but we did, we, I bought, I bought, I rented a house in, Pre, in Preano, which is like one town next to Positano. So it's on the Amalfi coast. So I felt a little bit of this. It's kind of like the, the less expensive Positano. Right. Um, Cause it doesn't have like the same like central adorable little town. Right. Uh, but um, it's a little scruffy. It's like Elba. Elba's a little Yeah, it's a little scruffy. Um, I mean, I may not be anymore. This was a long time ago, but I felt like I could just feel so much of that when I was reading it, just like that, that there's a certain like sun drenched aspect to it. 
and there are certain flowers and the scent of lemons as you know and it is lemons it's not limes like you get like if you go to Mexico it's all about the limes but here it's all about the lemons and um it just the I it felt like the setting was its own character in such a huge way so yeah so please tell us more about Elba so we can all book our tickets once we start traveling again oh and this is sorry this is my moment today like I am fully vaccinated and I think you all should be too so we can all start traveling again Please. So I'll yeah. just say I am fully vaccinated and I'm getting on a plane for Italy tomorrow. I'm a little scared, I will admit, but um, but I'm fully vaccinated. And I have flown actually a number of times during the, the pandemic for a number of reasons, but um, and I'm getting on a plane to New York tomorrow. So yes, but yes, get your vaccinations, everybody. They're good. Listen to science. Okay. Okay. All right. So yes. Um, you knew I had to do Italy that. Is, I mean, you've described Elba perfectly. Elba is the sort of the scruffy place where you go when you have small children and, and where we went. So all the descriptions of walking into a little restaurant that's sort of weather beaten and, you know, you sit down to this perfect bowl of pasta. I really haven't had terrible food anywhere in Italy except in Venice, which has ghastly food. So if okay. you ever go to Venice, you have to check, you know, have to read the New York Times recommendations first. But okay. every place else, like Florence, for example, you can just walk into some place off the main road, and you're going to have amazing pasta. And in Elba, you do have this, this thing that I talk about a little bit in the book, which is where people who are actually big chefs somewhere else will come home for the summer months. And that's something I never really knew that Michelin starred, you know, restaurants, sometimes the chefs will go home, whether they go home to Mexico or Spain or whatever for a month and try out new recipes in their little restaurant at home that's only open in the summer. And it's in a courtyard. So that in Italy and Elba, you'll have these courtyard restaurants that don't have any inside and they're really open only for the summer and maybe you know may may through part of september and so i had i i very deliberately wanted elba to be a character in the way that if you've read um like call me by your name or um oh me before you or a lot of these books in which a part of it takes place in a foreign country and you just feel that you could feel as if you're there Mm -hmm. I love those books. I love reading something that makes me feel as if I'm there and I'm eating with people and I'm at the table. I wanted you to be at the table with me and with Etta and Dante and Rohan and Gray. And, and I wanted us to be talking about the same books and to be, you know, singing Beatles songs badly or, or, you know, Monty Python badly or well or whatever. So I, I loved um, even the difference between like, I mean, I could feel the difference between the public beach and the private beach even, I loved that. It was just, it was wonderful. But um, now you guys always went to Elba. Did um, your husband's family go there when he was growing up too? Yep, that's why we went there. Italians are very, very traditional. Like there's a lot of little islands there we could have gone to, but we go to Elba because Alessandro went to Elba. So his family went to the mountains in August. So we used to go to Rivaretta in the mountains in August. and and then go to the beach in July. And so I'll say I'm flying to Italy tomorrow. And then on June 20th, I'm going to Elba and Anna's coming. So Anna, who's 12 years old um, in that little video you saw in the picture at the end that says Etta, that's actually Anna at age 12. Um, she lives with her boyfriend now in Rome for the summer. So they're coming. And Luca who played Dante in that film just because that was some old video we had lying around from Elba. Mm -hmm. um, He's coming with his girlfriend, Sophia, and we're all gonna be on the island. And we have rented a house, you'll love this, with no iNet coverage, no no phone, no cell coverage. Oh, wow. It'd be intense, there's only a dial-up modem. So it really, like, it's out on a rock. You have to leave the car and walk 12 minutes down like a rocky road. And then there's this amazing house that was built by a German Baroness in like 1960. So it's really- Oh, take lots yeah. and lots of pictures. So I want to see this. I will, I will. I mean, I'll see it all well after the fact, but yeah. And so, well, that actually kind of negates my next question is do you go to the same place? Every no, we, 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 we move around. Yeah, we did. When the kids were small, we used to go back to the same place because, you know, they want to go back where the same pool is and the same um, beach and the so on. And then for a and few the same years, gelato. 
that's important. Exactly, all that. The same pineta, which is the pine forest, the scruffy mm -hmm. pine forest, where you have like the slot machines and stuff, you know, they, they get attached. And then okay. they got a little older and then we would go to resort for a while, one of those ones that have a pool and, and sort of like, uh, you know, teenage dancing kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And then thank God we outgrew that. And then it's harder to get them back when they grow up. You know, your kids are still at the age where they're moving where you want them to move more or less. Sad. Don't make me sad. Um, I mean, here they are, they're coming back, right? As long as you rent a Baroness's house on Elba, you can lure them back. Okay, I'll, I will, I'll, I'll, Baroness's house is, this is what I'm, this is what I'm going for. Okay, can we see another one of the videos? Yes. Okay. Well, although I'm afraid if we do that, we're going to be back to real Disney's real housewives of Disney or something. Oh, I will handle it better. I mean, okay. you wouldn't believe it, but I did teach all some all, all semester without messing this up. So, okay. um, well, I messed it up a few times. Let's be real here. I just have to get over to the other page. Here we are. So I am. Um, okay. Okay. And like big shout out to all the people who are posting that they're vaccinated. Yay. Yay. Um, so let me just pick this up here. Hold on. While she's, while she's doing all this. So one person here said she is a scientist. And yep. as, as she can assure us that the vaccine side effects would be nothing in comparison to getting COVID. I can <laughs> attest to that too, although not from personal experience because I'm also married to a doctor. We have it. All right. Okay, guys, I'm going to share now to the second of our videos, which is the opening of Lizzie and Dante with the voiceover from a Fordham student and edited by Fordham students. Slice past the boat in froth, deep blue and gray. What kind of froth that made you think about pollutants? Off in distance. The island of Elba was a dim green mound. Elba isn't known for much. It produces a perfume called Aqua del Elba that smells of white flowers in the sea. It's regularly visited by yachts the size of the Titanic, but mostly it's the island where Napoleon was exiled with a throwaway title, Emperor of Elba. Busy Rose Delford was headed to Elba because of Napoleon's whining comment. Abel was I, ere I saw Elba. It had a dark humor that worked for Lizzie, a stupid little sentence, although the English professor in her noted that Abel was I was an aphorism, a factoid, as well as a palindrome. Symmetrical, beautiful, and meaningful in its own dark way. To Lizzie, perfect. There you go. Elba grew larger oh, in a lumpy no. sort of way. Same thing again. And German tourists standing oh, around watch the next one. pictures with okay, their cell phones. To go, the water turned clear turquoise closer to the shore, little white caps glinting like sparklers. Stores lined the harbor, and above them, smoky pink and saffron buildings sprawled on rounded hills. Okay, I've got the next one. Hold on. Do you want to do it right now? Well, I'll, I'll pull it up Elba here. grew larger in a lumpy sort of way, and German tourists standing in the helm took numerous pictures with their cell phones. Okay. Do you want to watch it directly or do you want to wait? I know Why don't we do it now? As long as we're like all set up. Okay. All right. Sorry about the, the lack of audio visual, like. It's, you're doing better than I would, that's for sure. I definitely should be better at this, but I'm not. Okay, here we go. Hi. And this is the third one. So this is the... Elba grew larger in a lumpy sort of way, and German tourists standing in the helm took numerous pictures with their cell phones. The water turned clear turquoise closer to the shore, little white caps glinting like sparklers. Stores lined the harbor, and above them, smoky pink and saffron buildings sprawled on rounded hills. The town looks so accidental, Lizzie said, liking the way the houses piled on top of each other and spilled down narrow streets. Italian
Italians don't do city planners, Grace said. Oh my goodness. I want to go. You want to go? Oh my goodness, yes. Although I have to say, it's, it's really kind of... I was starting to get comments from oh well God, people the third who one. would say to me, I don't understand how you can work out so up. much and still be so big. Then I tried noon oh and no, it's a horrible pretty ad. quickly I lost 10 pounds. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, it's a little warm here in Seattle right now. And so like, I'm sort of like, oh. I really want to go to a hot place and and like warm for Seattle is like not warm for anyone else we're just wimps but um but it did look so wonderful oh my goodness Leslie Rudolph just said it will be more crowded once everybody reads the book seriously are you getting a kickback from like the Elba tourism board because you should well maybe if people start going I didn't I didn't really think of that I feel I, like I feel like your I publisher needs to be making sure it's in like all the tourist shops in Elba yeah, hopefully. Yes. hopefully end up to Random House, you know, I guess the distribution. But so what is on your I'm almost afraid to ask you what's next because okay, so this is where I have to confess to everybody, like part of our friendship, our relationship as friends is me being like, Oh my gosh, you're so productive. You get so much done and I do nothing. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure she actually sleeps. Um, we other friends, we have discussed you behind your back being like we don't think she actually sleeps um <laughs> how did she get everything done um oh. oh sorry someone was saying my daughter just moved to seattle they're stationed there and there's no air conditioning yes i was just saying that we don't have it but you know we rarely need it um so are you thinking about doing more mary bly books i don't know okay that's a fair know. answer i'll tell you what i'm taking june off nice I'm just going to read books and um, hang out because I'm tired. I mean, it, for those of you, if there's anyone here who's a teacher, teaching on Zoom has been extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just because I mess this up, because I actually sort of organize myself when I'm teaching and I know what I'm doing. But um, it's exhausting trying to get, you know, a class of 16, which is how many I teach, you know, all their little faces are there and trying to get them excited about a Shakespeare play is just exhausting. So... I'm going to take June off and then I'm going to think I'm I have just finished I have the edits to do of a novel called um, how to be a wallflower, which is going to be my next romance so okay. that's fun. And Carrie liked it Carrie's my editor, she mm -hmm. said yes have a new beginning and a new end but that's typical for me. So I'm kind of like okay fine, but then I don't know I don't know it took me four years to write. You know well yes, but you were also writing lots of other things at the same time. I know, right. but it, it, part of part of how long it took is that the plot is so different from, say, a romance. I know a room. I mean, I know the bones of a romance inside out. And this bringing together, you know, all the discussions and like um, even bringing together all those characters and having them moving from place to place or talking in the same place. And and because I had, for example, characters of color. Which I've only I've only had a hero who was um, biracial Indian and, and English once before, so to adequately represent characters of color was really really challenging as it is I think for any white author, mm -hmm. and so I'm not saying that I wouldn't want to do it, but I'm just saying it it it's a real challenge. <laughs> and which actually brings me to another question you said to me. Um, again, thinking about the difference between writing this and writing uh, historical romance, because when you were saying with romance, you know what you're doing, you know the bones of a romance. And that's something I've often mentioned to people that, you know, one thing to me is like, I know I know how to write a romance novel. It may right. not feel like it when you're in the middle of it at times, but you know you can do it and you, you have a sense of, rhythm's not quite the right word, but you know, like you've done it enough so you can feel like, huh, this is moving too fast, or this isn't where I should be at this part of the book. You you know, there's something that has become somewhat instinctual. And so taking on Lizzie and Dante, to me, would be taking on something where, you know, none of your instincts apply. Exactly. They do not apply. And that book doesn't fall into a nice genre. 
we have I mean, a much bigger canvas. Yeah, but there's also not a lot of books that are kind of like it. I mean, there's there's love stories that take place in foreign places. So mm -hmm. there's darker ones like Beautiful Ruins, and then there's there's ones like Call Me by Your Name or um, Eat, Pray, Love is a good example of something that takes place in a foreign place. And you know, I that's... love the Eat and the Pray, but no, mm -hmm. I love the Eat and the Love. Two chapters work for me. I like the Eat and the uh, Love. Love. I didn't like Pray so much. Pray. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. But you know, it's the eat love. I don't want to pray. But examples are not a genre. So like when I was learning how to write historical romance, I had a million fabulous writers, you know, you among them. I, you know, when did your first book, when did? My well, first book came out in 95. Yeah. So, okay. So, you know, that's five years before mine. So I was reading everyone and learning as much as I could and trying to figure out how to do it. That's a little harder with this genre. And so, the idea of writing another Mary Bly book, I do have an idea for one. Um, it would be set in England because I, I got an MPhil at Oxford, so it'd be set in Oxford. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. I need some time off. <laughs> yeah. Well, so one of the questions I was thinking though is that you know when you're writing romance, I, and I always tell people like just because we you know not very articulate today, but we don't have a formula. We have parameters. Yeah. That's the way I like to describe it. And, you know, and, and the two big parameters are you need to have your two main characters meet or re-meet or whatever. And then you have to have your happily ever after. Right. And, and how you get from one place to the other, there's a wide open, whatever you want to do. Um, but it is overall a smaller canvas than a book like Lizzie and Dante. And in some ways that makes it harder. And in some ways that makes it easier, you know, from different respects. But one way that, I don't know if it makes it easier, but we know where it's going. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm wondering is when you're writing a book like Lizzie and Dante, again, here I am sure. <laughs> I'm being so good here. I'm always I'm terrible about remembering to have my books in the background, but here, here we go. Um, did you ever like have these points where you kept changing your mind about what was going to happen? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with someone who's got a cancer diagnosis, right? The question is, are you going to write like a total tearjerker and like have an incredible death scene on the page? And mm -hmm. that, I just don't write that kind of books. My books are optimistic. Mm -hmm. And so I, in the end, even though I, I toyed, I was like, I could be writing real literature. Like, you know, I could write a death scene everyone else does in literature. Well, and you know, I, my famous quote, it's now famous is you always get more respect when you don't have a happy end. Exactly. Exactly. So, I, I could get some serious respect. Like, you know, I could write a real book. And then I realized that's not the book that that I'm going to write. I, I write about love stories. And mm -hmm. this is this is this is a love story. It's a different, bigger love story, but it's a love story. And in my mind, when you fall in love, it goes on forever. And and that's the kind of love that I want to write about so that even if Lizzie isn't there in 20 years, that love story has changed everyone's life who knew her. And I don't want the reader to leave with that, you know, with, with a death scene or something. I want her to go back to Elba the next summer. I want her, and this is a little bit of spoiler, but she's got to buy that red bra for Etta. This is true. And she does. I feel like I, dang it. I tried to find a picture of Anna in a red bra to show you guys because that red bra conversation happened in my life. She was like, I want a red bra. And her dad was like, you can't have a red bra. You're only 12 or whatever. And I was like, oh, you can have a red bra later when you're bigger, older. So, well, and now I don't know how, how old is she now? 21, 22? She is okay. 20. She can buy all her own red bras now. Yes, um, and but not what I'm thinking like not even though just for Lizzie and because that's obviously like the biggest question will she live will she die what is she going to get her treatment but all these other characters too did you toy with the idea of just doing different things for them yeah uh, well not like Rohan and Gray I knew that I wanted I knew what I wanted Gray's story to be right because I I wanted to be writing about something um I wanted to write that love is more fluid than the categories we, we keep trying to put it in. So Gray loves Lizzie. He he absolutely loves Lizzie. And mm -hmm. he absolutely loves Rohan as well. He's mm -hmm. in love with Rohan. 
but I mean, love is this powerful thing that doesn't necessarily limited by gender, even though he says, you know, I'm, he's gay, basically, or he's bi or whatever. But um, I, I wanted to write about people who had, who, who, who weren't, who weren't fixed within the bounds of what we generally write about in the kind of historical romance that you and I write, which is not the only kind that exists by any means. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Remarked. then another character I was so intrigued about was Joseph. That's his name, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, and it was really interesting to me because he was, he was on screen for such a short time. Yeah, so there is one. He was on screen more in early, in oh. different versions. So Joseph is based on the poet Don Hall, who was the poet laureate of the United States and was a dear friend of my father's mm -hmm. and became a dear friend of mine. He wrote my recommendation to get into Harvard. He wrote my recommendation to get into Oxford. Um, in both cases, he was successful. Uh, you know, I got in. Um, I, I adored him and he taught me an enormous amount, you know, in the way that your parents know about poetry, but they don't actually end up teaching you that much because they're your parents. Whereas mm -hmm. he is back to came in like my freshman year and I didn't know how to write an essay and he'd written this great book called writing well. And he took me to his farm in New Hampshire, his wife was this amazing poet as well, and stuck me in a back room and said, you know, writing is hard work. And you can come out in like four hours. And what I was not learning in college was that writing is hard work and you have to sit at the desk for four hours, but he taught me that. Mm -hmm. So I wanted Joseph, I wanted this old poet to be this moment in there. Um, and the poem that they're talking about is a poem by James Wright, who is my godfather. Um, so that's his, probably his most famous poem. And mm -hmm. it's, it's got this line about a chicken hawk that circles looking for home, right? Searching for home because Lizzie is circling and looking for home. And the moment when she lands on the branch, she becomes a songbird Then she sings because songbirds sing to mate. So when she starts singing for Dante, she's no longer circling and looking for home. She's found home and I home is her family. To tell you, Mary, I think you did write a real book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just, I'm just listening to like what you're talking about her. I'm like, I mean, not that any of our other books are real books, but like, I think, I think there might, you might have a capital L literature here too. Um, there's, there's, yeah, there's a lot to talk about and, and, um, but we are running, I think, low on time and I know I only have. Hi, Grace. Oh, Hi. Anyway, yeah, so Grace I could here. listen to you talk, both of you for hours. I really could. And I know we all could, but we've got some audience questions. So okay. let's jump into those. And I will also take a look in the chat because I think people have some questions in there too. But before we start any of that, um, everybody wants to say to Mary that they love their love your hair. I think that is the, the trend in the chat is that your hair looks amazing. And we all agree. I got a cut yesterday, but I have one thing I was before because I know that everyone in the chat is going to be very polite and just ask about Lizzie and Dante but I've got to say I have been looking on Instagram Julia and I'm seeing pictures of Mr. Bridgerton senior and yeah. I'm like wait a second wait can, can you just explain that like is that part of the prequel thing about the queen or what is going on with the Bridgerton just give us a little update well I I am not allowed to say much but what I think you can infer yeah. from that um because he has been hired for bridgerton season two which takes place in the bridgerton present so i think you can infer that there will be flashbacks so we're gonna see him die mm -hmm. i i get netflix it gets so cranky about leaks if i could okay so i was like direct messaging with nicola nicola coughlin today she, yeah, as one does. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just had to do that. I swear, I don't direct message with the actors like every day, but I happen to be doing it. And she sent me like a little picture or something. And, you know, she's saying that she has to be careful she, about stuff because of Netflix. And I was, we were talking about how cranky they get about leaks. But there was a yellow dress in the background. Um, <laughs> you know, she's Penelope. But yeah, they do get really, really cranky about leaks. So I have to be really careful. Like when I get scripts or anything, they're watermarked with a massive Julia Quinn across them. So, you know, if they leak, I'm in big, 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 big trouble. Oh. 
Um, but yeah, but the guy playing Edmund is, I mean, doesn't he, he looks so much like many, I mean, it's great yeah. casting. Yeah, I think it's great. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just say for those of you who aren't on Instagram, there's some amazing photographs going around of the filming. So they, they can try to conceal things, but people are obviously yeah. with long distance things because the shots of the, the, you know me, I'm obsessed by clothes, right? Anyone who reads my historicals knows that. I am following all these like Portuguese Richardson blogs because they've got all the clothes. I know, I know. If we ever get to England at the same time, I'll have to try to get you and see the Bridgerton costume warehouse because I mean, it, I, when I went in there, I thought of you instantly because I was like, oh my gosh, Mary would just pass out. Is so you costume would be warehouse? Well, it's where all the costumes are. It's, I, it's. Oh my God. I think I you both awesome. are going to be going to England really yeah. soon. Tell me yeah. when you're going, Julia, I will be there. Okay, yeah, it's. It's unbelievable. And I actually went there before I went on the set. So I, I went there twice. Once I did when in Bath, they were doing, you know, uh, location shooting. And then the time I went to visit the actual set, they actually took me to the costume place first. So I saw that first and I was just, it, it's like a feast for the senses. You get in there and you just want to just pet everything. And it's, it's just incredible. So um, Julia, I have, I have a suggestion. The Oxford, do you know what the Oxford Union is? It's this ancient debating society, like Winston Churchill debated there. And they invited me. Me too. Yeah. We should go at the same time. When are you going to go? When, are you invited for this summer? Well, I, I don't even remember. I said, I mean, I, I couldn't do it, but they were, yeah. I, we should go and we should defend romance at the same time and visit the Bridgerton costume warehouse i don't know i get very scared by debating it i uh, oh come on it'd be great you know i, don't know. I, I think it's too many arguments with my brother who can like debate circles around me and it, it you're wounded <laughs> oh well okay Some of that italian wine and then you can do it okay yeah <laughs> After okay. A few drinks, so let's about. launch into the questions um this is from natalie if there are romantic scenes how much is based on personal experience versus imagination books or google oh my goodness um this reminds me of like every time i have like you know, because if you've written 30 romances, as Julia knows, after a while, you can't, you can't repeat yourself endlessly. So you end up people having, making love on the stairs. And then people write you and say, have you ever made love on the stairs? I'm like, no, it sounds really uncomfortable. But you know what? It works for the book. So um, I have never danced on the sand while someone sang a song because I can't even keep a tune. But my imagination put people dancing on the sand especially Lizzie and Dante. The thing is, by the time you get around to writing the love song, the, you know, the, the love scene in this case, um, I knew them so well and I, and I so much wanted them to be happy that I could see what Dante would do, you know, and I could see, I could, when they, when they make love for the first time, there's this joke about the silver surfer. I could see that, you know, that, that the silver surfer, just made sense with who they are because they become so real to me. Oh, that's beautiful. Julia, do you want to answer that question as well? Um, no, I think she did a good job. <laughs> this so, is a um, also for you, Mary, do you feel differently you writing, do you feel differently writing under your name? No. <laughs> oh, I, I, Eloisa is pretty much me too. So yeah, no, I did have a problem. The first book that I signed for Lizzie and Dante, I signed it Eloisa. And then I was like, oh crap. <laughs> well, that's a collector's item now. We'll take that. <laughs> yeah. How did you two meet and how long have you been friends? Oh my God, it's been forever. I know exactly how we met on the internet, which okay. is that my first book came out, it's called Potent Pleasures. And, um, and if you go look up that book now, I'm sure it's all still there on Amazon. It came out and it was in hardcover and it made a lot of people really angry. And I had all these historical errors in there and I never heard a point of view POV. Now I never heard of it because I never took any creative writing classes. And then there were all these one-star reviews on Amazon. I would go in and cry. And then all of a sudden I was like, why are you reading these? You have to stop reading them. And then I got an email from someone who was a real author whose books I had read, which was Julia Quinn. And she was like, don't listen to them. Don't listen to that crap. You've got to keep writing the way you're writing. And I was like, oh my God, Julie Quinn is writing me. I don't even remember doing that, but I do remember it being a really big deal when your first book came out because romance never came out in his hardcover. And 
and uh, and especially not historical romance. It's occasionally um, a contemporary was, and so it was kind of a big deal. And we were all kind of jealous. I mean, I was like, who is this person? What's going on here? You know. And so I think there definitely were some people in the biz who were, you know, maybe not inclined to want to like her. But you know, then you meet her; she's so likable. Um, but I just read the book and was like, this is fabulous. I just I thought it was amazing. And she wrote me and said that jealousy or no jealousy, who cares? She wrote me and said, don't listen to what they're saying. I was, get, I was, I was freaking out. I mean, I was really freaking out. And, uh, and I made them recopy edit the book. And I was just like, and, and yeah. Julia- well, I don't remember reading it thinking yeah. it, like there were a ton of wrong things in there. And I, I do sometimes think that about books that I read. So I don't remember thinking that. I mean, no, but I'm it must not- have been, I was living in, when did that come out? Because I can remember I was living in Denver, but I don't remember. Nine, 99 2000 something okay, like that, that. Yeah. i think i read it and it came out in 2000 i mean i put my hero in pajamas and i remember my husband reading an early draft well number one he was horrified by the sex he was like this this are you sure that people actually write this i was like yeah no i'm really sure like this is nothing compared to the flame and the flower yes. he was horrified by that and then the hero's name was Alexander and he thought it was too close to Alessandro and people might like get confused so he was horrified by that and then he was like you know I don't think that people were like I can't remember what the word was concubine or something and I was like oh nobody cares about that it's romance and he was like I don't think they were in pajamas because he's a medieval scholar I was like oh that doesn't matter I don't want him in a nightshirt of course I should have just had him naked but yeah seriously Well, that's a perfect lead into the next question, which is, does your husband get questioned about things you write, whether he did those things? Uh, No, not anymore. These (laughs) days, thanks to the success of Bridgerton, what is mostly happening is Paul goes into work and people are like, dude, why are you still here? (laughs) (laughs) How come you haven't quit your job yet? Uh, But he he has hospital because we need him in infectious diseases it's true he is, he is still very much needed but um yeah no he just he does say that sometimes there's you know i don't think people ask him about specific questions but he does get you know he says it's a lot to live up to um but one of my favorite moments was he forwarded an email he got from a medical student once because he, te- he teaches in the med school as well and you know she was thanking him for something he had done to help her out and then she goes by the way she goes you were already like my favorite professor at school, but oh my God, like in all caps, I just found out who your wife was. <laughs> you have gone way up in my estimation, <laughs> which is always fun for me because like, he's like, you know, such the superstar, you know. And you're like, see, yeah, you get a little from me. At time. No, I mean, I was, I was, one of my fun things that happened to me during the coronavirus is I started listening to the news all the time and like flipping out. And then I was like, wait, I know that voice. I know that voice. And it was Paul. <laughs> he was on the news a lot. I yeah. think what happens is the reporters, they discover um, a doctor who can be very articulate on camera and then they just latch on. They don't want to let go. And he did so many re- uh, pieces for this one local reporter named Tammy Mutasa, who I adore. If you're here in Seattle, you should all watch Tammy. Um, that when he did one for someone else, we were all like, you're cheating on Tammy, dude. This is not okay. (laughs) Um, Sharon asked, do you two have any more future collaborations planned like the lady most willing? I don't think we do right now. Maybe. No, and that's my fault. It's my turn to come up with the plot. I never really did, but. um, Connie may have stopped writing too, so. Yeah. I see, I see, I follow her Instagram too, and she looks incredibly happy in Florida. She's tanned. She was playing croquet the other day. <laughs> yeah, every now and then I see she pops up into my consciousness looking like very blissful, like very happily not working. So, her so we'll have to see. Do you have to get approval by submitting an outline before you go ahead and write the book? No. I technically. I mean, it's in my contract that I do, um, but I'm sure if I wanted to not do it that way, I could, but it actually works very well for me in terms of getting me rolling and moving. So I keep it, it works out. And Sue asks um, if there's gonna be a sequel on the daughter, Etta, and um, will you be building on the characters and their storylines? 
Well, you know, it's set in 2019, right? And Etta was 12. So, I mean, I'm going to have to take like six years before she can do anything interesting and be even 18. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think this is a, a moment in time book. And this is one for both of you. Um, do you miss reader or writer conferences? Yes, I, I do. do. I really do. I miss meeting readers and I miss like going and hanging out with Julia. I know, it's true. We call me. It's fun. So I, I yeah, I miss Remember that one people. conference we went to and we walked around and around the hotel. I mean, those are things um, we were walking around the outside of the hotel. Yeah, really well, that's because I do this thing where I, I it's a yeah. step bet and I have to get a certain number of steps per day or I lose actual money. And I you went know, around and around the hotel. I made her walk around the hotel. It was in Spokane. I made you walk around the hotel with me like four times. Um, I actually wanted to say one thing because somebody brought it up and it was on my mind today about the graphic novel. If I could do a, a one little plug. Yeah, absolutely. So in August, I have a graphic novel coming out. So that's something new and different for me and it is um it's based uh, well so there's this book within a book that is paired within my books called miss butterworth and the mad baron which is just this funny over-the-top gothic novel very poorly written um and so when readers started asking me to write it i just saying like i can't keep that up for a whole book but it makes a great graphic novel and my younger sister is a cartoonist so we work together and it's coming out this august and this this has probably been as long in the making as Lizzie and Dante was. This was, a, wow. it was a long time to do it. Um, I've never truly collaborated on something like this, although truthfully it's 85% her because she had to do all the art. Um, but it's super fun and you can get autograph copies from both of us exclusively from University Bookstore. Um, we just confirmed today that Violet's going to come and she's going to visit in August so we can go in and because for a while it was going to be book plates, but no, they will be signed in the book, maybe even a doodle and everybody who orders it gets these super cute pigeon magnets. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> that's Sylvia Van Nest. This is Rebecca. <laughs> and this one's my favorite. Eggs Meralda. Oh, oh her little so baby. Cute. There we go. See? Oh, that's adorable. Yeah, I won't tell you what these pigeons actually do because. <laughs> well, they peck someone to death. Yes, any... Okay, the pigeons do peck someone to death. And so this was a very challenging thing to come up with. How do you make the pigeons sympathetic if they're going to peck someone to death? And I, I'm very <laughs> proud of our, our creativity and coming up with a way to do this and, and to make you still love all the pigeons. So that sounds great. Oh, so everyone's look, intrigued. <laughs> my, my sister just chimed in to give, my sister who, who does my website and Mary's just chimed in to tell you all how to order the book. Um, yes, yeah, so it's just if you go to my website and get in there, but um, you can pre-order it now and you can put in like who you want it signed to and we will both be there and maybe I guess Sharpies for that one. I don't know, but they'll all be signed. We've got lots of Sharpies so you can stay and draw to your heart's content. <laughs> yes. We have an entire, for those who don't know, we have an entire basement area of our store dedicated to Julia Quinn orders. <laughs> it has slowed down. It's her wing of the bookstore. I'm thinking of like just coming in every day with my computer and working there, you know, it's cool. It's, it's your, it's your space. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to wear a mask. We'll kick Dan out though. <laughs> He's pretty quiet. He has his earbuds yeah, in. <laughs> won't notice me. Well, thank you, Mary and Julia, for stopping by and celebrating the publication of Mary's Lizzie and Dante, which Julia is holding up right now. And a huge thank you to our audience today for spending an hour with us and a good book. You may purchase copies of Lizzie and Dante through University Bookstore, and we're going to drop that link in the chat. And they come with beautiful signed book plates. So thank you again for joining us and please check our website, social media, or sign up for our emails to hear about other upcoming virtual events, including maybe one that involves pigeons. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Well, so thank you again. If and I both say, of you have a great trip. I think everybody here probably bought this book. So I'm here to remind you that you could always buy another copy as a gift. It's a lovely gift book signed by the author. You can hold on to it until the holidays. Real one. Oh, there's a real one. I like mine. I don't know. Um, beautiful present. Yes. So this is, I'm going into sales mode. Make, autograph books make delightful gifts. I have very good news today, which is that um, this is Apple. Apple Books is made it 
one of the books of the month. Oh, yay. Hey, so that's wonderful. Yeah, so this is something Congrats. buy for your mom and she'll love it for Christmas. Yes, buy it for everybody, you know, so you can start your own book clubs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, look at this one. Somebody bought two. Yay, Patricia. We love people hey. like you. Okay. Bye, everybody. I have to go pack. Okay. My, flight, my flight's at 7 a.m., so I got to. Oh, I gotta. no. Well, have a great trip, both of you, and I hope to see lots of Italian beach photos from Mary. <laughs>